This is this is crazy. You have legs. I do. Who knew? I have I have an upper torso. I was ninety nine percent positive it was just chest up with no, you. No. Okay. No. This is nuts. I actually wear pants too. in the flesh. Tonight was the final AEW Dynamite before Revolution this Sunday and the final Dynamite with the current set. Uh, we are supposed to be getting a new set next week. It was also Sting's farewell, his final appearance here on Dynamite before his retirement match, and we had Sting descending from the rafters on a Turner network. It felt like 1997. It felt like we had gone back in the time machine here. Back to the Monday Night War period. I was actually shocked. I was legitimately shocked that they did that on the show tonight, considering that, you know, this is the company that works with Owen Hart's widow, and I, I don't know if Tony Khan, not that he needs her permission, but, you know, had a conversation with her about it, reached out to her. It could be a touchy subject. Um, I just did not expect them to have Sting repelling from the ceiling. It's a cool visual. And it's been a very long time since we've seen something like that. Uh, but they did it. And it uh, doesn't matter how many years go by. I mean, Sting did it all the time, you know, back in WCW. But no matter how many years go by, I just can't, I can't see that and not think of what happened to Owen. It sucks. Uh, but that was my first thought. But they did it. And Sting came down and he made the save for Darby Allen and for Ric Flair. Not before allowing his friends to come out and get their asses handed to them. Did Sting finally decide to descend from the heavens and make the save there at the end? Uh, and that is how they went off the air. We also got some clarity from Hangman Adam Page. He was advertised on the show tonight to reveal his status ahead of the three-way match for the AEW World title coming up at Revolution on Sunday. And last week, it looked as if he had injured his ankle. Either injured his ankle, his Achilles, something happened at the end of the show. And, 
yeah, you're concerned about that because you're heading into a pay-per-view where this guy is one third of your world title match. And then it was, you know, reported online that he's not actually hurt. There could be a personal issue. He may or may not be on the pay-per-view, but it's not an injury. It was, it was a cover reason he's not actually hurt. And he made that very clear tonight because he came out feigning an injury. But by the time his segment was over, he laid out Swerve Strickland with a crutch. Hangman is healthy. Hangman will be there at Revolution on Sunday. The world title match is still intact. Someone else who popped up on the show tonight was Will Ospreay. Will Ospreay is all elite. He signed his contract back in November and said, let me finish my obligations first to New Japan, and then you will have all of me. Well, now his obligations are over, and Tony Khan has every bit of Will Ospreay. He came out tonight. They were in Huntsville, Alabama. I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think that Will Ospreay has probably ever wrestled a match in Huntsville, Alabama. He may never have wrestled in the state of Alabama, but he came out there tonight. It is very encouraging to hear the kind of reaction that he got. They treated him like a superstar. He came out there and got a tremendous reaction, even though he is technically part of the Don Callis family. We can we can see you look into the future, and you can see that's not going to last very long. But he did have a uh, a handshake with Kanosuke Takeshita tonight ahead of their match coming up on Sunday, which is going to be fucking unbelievable. Uh, we also had a Chris Jericho match on this show, and he got in the ring with Atlantis Jr. from CMLL. And they explained the history with Jericho and his father, Atlantis Sr., going back to Jericho's days in Mexico 30 years ago. And as soon as this partnership began between AEW and CMLL, they said Jericho immediately knew that he wanted a match with Atlantis' son. And we got that match on the show tonight, and I'm not sure why. I mean, forget the story they told. I know why they explained Jericho wanted to wrestle this kid. What I don't understand is why we needed to see this match tonight. This is the go-home show to a pay-per-view on Sunday. Jericho didn't even have a match on the pay-per-view until tonight. Now he's in a match. I'll tell you what that match is a little bit later. But, you know, Atlanta certainly is not wrestling on Sunday. You've got a pay-per-view that you're building toward. What the hell did you have to do Chris Jericho against Atlantis Jr. on the go-home show for? It's a very odd choice. I don't know why they had to do that match tonight, but they did. And look, I came into this never having seen any of Atlantis Jr. before. I know who Atlantis is. I've heard the name. I, I'm aware. Uh, of how big of a name he is and was in Lucha Libre. I know that, but I've not seen Atlantis Jr. work before until tonight. Not impressed. Sorry. Not impressed. Although the fans in uh, Huntsville certainly enjoyed the match. So, hey, more power to them. I'm glad they enjoyed it. I'm glad, I'm glad they had a good time. I was not a fan of this match. On the whole, though, I did think it was a good episode. I thought that they did a good job for most of the matches on the show on Sunday of, you know, setting the table for Revolution. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be running down the Revolution card a little bit later on. Uh, we'll go through the card coming up on Sunday and predictions as well. Can you guys hear me? I see some people saying that they can't hear me. Some people say they can. Some people can't. Are you sure? Is everything cool? You can hear me? Are we good here? We are having storm issues here in New York. So again, if something is off, let me know. And I will try to fix it. But uh, yes, it is very, it is very windy and it is very, so I'm low. I'm low. I don't, I, I'm maxed out on, I'll tell you what, let me see. Here. Let me play with this. So I want you all to heal me. To heal me. I want you all to heal me. Hurt me and heal me. Now, I want, I want to make sure you guys can hear me, so give me a second here. And I will see what I can do for you. Let's see here. I'm going to bump this up a little bit. There you go. So now you guys let me know if that's a little bit better. If it's too loud, I will lower it. I don't want it to be too loud either, so keep me posted in the live chat. But what I was saying is, uh, later on in the stream, I'm going to run down the Revolution card. I'm going to go through predictions. Uh, there was a change, a late change to the card. One match was canceled. Although now this, this replacement match that they've added, I'm not sure. I'm very confused because 
one of the matches on the card was changed due to what Tony Khan on Twitter said was due to injury. There were injury, there were medical issues. I'm thinking, okay, the men, some of the men in the match obviously are hurt. And then they announced the replacement match, and every single person in the original match <laughs> is in the new match. So I'm not sure why the match had to change in the first place. We'll run that down. But before we get into all that, I did want to make mention uh, here. Unfortunately, there were three deaths this week, three deaths in a 48-hour time span. And it is true, I guess, what they say. They come in threes. Two wrestling-related deaths, one non-wrestling-related death, but I did want to uh, mention it here. We learned on Monday that Ole Anderson, one of the founding fathers of the Four Horsemen, uh, former wrestler, former booker, passed away. I believe he was 81 years old. Tony Schiavone made mention of him tonight. Tony Schiavone was very close with him, and Ole was the one who he credits with having uh, given him his start in the business. So Ole passed away at the beginning of the week. And then we heard earlier this morning that Virgil, uh, Mike Jones passed away. Soul Train Jones, Vincent in the NWO. Uh, he'll most be remembered for his run in WWE as Virgil, the manager or the manservant of the Million Dollar Man. And uh, I was sad to hear that. I know he had gone through some health problems. I think he had, uh, well, I know he had, I think, dementia. He may have suffered a, a whole series of strokes not that long ago. So I know that his health was not uh, great. You know, as far as Virgil is concerned, I mean, and, and people have shared a lot of Virgil stories today. I don't have a personal Virgil story to tell. Uh, I did meet him briefly. It was at a convention. I don't remember which one. Uh, but my, my lasting memory of Virgil, honestly, you know, from that early Million Dollar Man run is when he finally broke free of the Million Dollar Man when he walloped him upside the head with the million dollar belt at the Royal Rumble in 91 and just the great reaction that it got because people were genuinely happy to see this man finally stand up for himself and break away from DiBiase. And then later that year when he won the million dollar title, that was his crowning moment in wrestling. It never got any better than that for him. That was his greatest achievement at SummerSlam was beating DiBiase and winning that million dollar belt. So that's my lasting wrestling memory of him, but uh, obviously, he played a lot of different roles and uh, was very sorry to hear that he had passed away. And then the other uh, death that was reported earlier this afternoon, again, nothing to do with wrestling, but actor and comedian Richard Lewis passed away. I believe he was 76. He was also very ill. He had a lot of things wrong with him, uh, but it was a heart attack. And I had just seen him on an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm from the new season. This is the final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he was on the episode last weekend. Uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. And he'll probably pop up at a few more before the season is over. So I, I guess not completely unexpected, just in terms of uh, him being in poor health. But, uh, you know, still, you don't expect to hear something like that. Heart attack, I mean, who can predict? So again, very sad to hear about uh, all the death this week. It is amazing how they tend to come in bunches sometimes. So let's hope it ends there. And let's hope by the time I get to the podcast on Sunday, we don't have uh, any more to, to talk about. This is your Dynamite Review for Wednesday, February 28, 2024. This is the final Dynamite Review here for the month of February. This is the final stream period for the month of February. So let's try to uh, have a good one here tonight. Subscribe. 450 likes is the goal for Be The Booker. Super Chats are open. And uh, also, for those of you who may be interested, there is a sale going on on ProWrestlingTees.com slash off. Any shirt in the Sound Off store, you can get 20% off. Now through Monday. Just make sure you use the code MADNESS24. It is Merch Madness. And it is underway right now for the next several days, so be sure to check that out. Now, there's actually some news I wanted to just mention here first, since we're talking about CMLL and the CMLL stars coming in to AEW. Uh, obviously, we had one on the show tonight. There was some news earlier today, and it could have a direct impact on AEW, so I wanted to talk about it very briefly here. But PW Insider had a story earlier today that uh, there is a visa issue that is affecting 
nearly two dozen different talents from CMLL that may prevent them from being able to work here in the U.S., and it could be a fairly substantial amount of time. So in a situation that could have quite a negative ripple effect on upcoming events, PW Insider has learned that U.S. work visas for nearly 20 CMLL stars in Mexico are in the process of being canceled by the United States government. Once that happens, it could take months for new visas to go through the approval process and to be issued. PW Insider is told that 19 luchadors, including Volador Jr., Echicero, and Mascara Dorada, who have all appeared on AEW programming of late, as well as Blue Panther, and there's a whole bunch of names here, uh, but he goes through the list. They're all expected to be impacted and unable to perform in the United States. And unless there is some sort of miracle to sort all of this out, which seems very unlikely, these talents would not be able to travel into the U.S. illegally to perform until a new visa is acquired for them. And such a process, they say, could take months if everybody involved pays some uh, very expensive fees to expedite things and if everything goes as smoothly as possible. But anybody that reads about the visa process knows that things don't always go all that smoothly. So that's probably being optimistic that this could get resolved in as little as a couple of months. More likely, this could take six, up to 6 to 12 months to work itself out. And the reason I tie this into AEW is because there's been a lot of talk that this next Forbidden Door show coming up, which we just learned, not officially from AEW, but Andrew Zarian broke the news last week, and we'll see if Tony Khan confirms it at the press scrum this weekend. But the reports are that Forbidden Door in June is going to be taking place at Arthur Ashe Stadium here in New York City. And there's talk that there could be a very heavy CMLL influence on that show because, you know, in a lot of ways, the bloom is kind of off the rose at this point. The whole Forbidden Door concept was a very novel thing a couple of years ago, but now we see so much interaction with New Japan talent on the show back and forth that they might want to... You know, instead of focusing just exclusively on AEW and New Japan, they may want to have some CMLL influence, maybe stardom influence on the show. That could be very difficult if you have a number of uh, CMLL talents that can't make their way into the U.S. to come to New York for the show. So that'll be a story to follow. Uh, we'll see if that gets resolved. I mean, the show is still a few months away. But again, this is a process that normally takes several months. So uh, we don't really know exactly how that's going to work out. So tonight's show started with Hangman Adam Page limping his way to the ring on a crutch to make an announcement about his status for Revolution after it looked like he injured his leg at the end of last week's uh, Dynamite in the main event. So he got into the ring and he talked about uh, when AEW started. He says it was a goal for him. It was a chance to raise people's expectations and meet their expectations. And he would like to think that he's done so. And the fans cheered. He likes to think that him winning the AEW world title in 2021 was the biggest achievement of his career. And that's why it hurts so much to have to deal with this. And as he said that, he looked down at his leg. When AEW decided the world title would be decided upon in a three-way match. He said it was horseshit. And he said he meant that. He stands by that. He thought it should be decided in a singles match, but it looks like he had the wrong two competitors in mind. And then he announced that he will unfortunately not be able to compete in the world title match at Revolution this weekend. That brought out Swerve and Prince Nana. They came down to the ring, he said, these last six months, you and me, Hangman, we've been at war with each other. We've tried to kill each other, but I didn't expect this to happen. He said, I targeted you because of everything you accomplished here in AEW. And he said that he had, basically he said he had the utmost respect for him. But he goes, it's fate. You can't avoid fate and you can't change your destiny. My destiny is going to revolution and becoming the AEW world champion. That brought out the champ, Samoa Joe. He walked out on stage. He didn't get into the ring with them, but he walked out on, on the ramp. He had a mic in hand. 
And Joe said, well, what do we have here? He said, we got two bitter enemies trying to hug it out. A lot of lies being told out here, so allow me to correct them. He goes, he's watched these two stare daggers at each other, but only to avoid making eye contact with him and realizing who the real champion is. He called Hangman Hopalong. He keeps hearing about both men are two young, hungry title contenders. He goes, but that's ridiculous. He goes, the two of you are battle-tested, very accomplished wrestlers. But what they need to realize is the reason that they're hungry is because he is starving their asses. What they really need to be worried about is that he is Samoa Joe. He is the AEW world champion, and whether it's one or both of them come revolution, he is going to whip both of their asses. So Swerve told him, hey, 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 stop right there, because Joe was about to leave. And Swerve tells him, stop right there. He said, I'm the man who broke into a wrestling school and left an 18-year-old boy laying in a pool of his own blood. I'm the man who broke into another man's home. And he told Joe he could go back to doing commentary again wearing a poncho. He said he's on the verge of making history, and this Sunday he will become the AEW world champion. And as he said that, all of a sudden, praise be, Hangman Page is healed. He attacks Swerve from behind with the crutch, and he just blasted him with this thing. And he was moving pretty damn well for a guy who was not going to be able to compete in a world title match on Sunday. And so he's got this crazed look in his eyes, and he's looking down at Swerve, and then he looks back up at Joe in the aisle, and he starts screaming, he won't be the champion. You won't be the champion. I will. I will, damn it. So it was all a ruse. It was all a big ruse. Hangman Page, he fooled everybody. Okay, so he really did. <laughs> he really he really didn't fool anybody. You know, this is one of those times where I do wish that it had not leaked during the week that he was not really hurt. And so there could have been some you know, wondering, is he or isn't he? I mean, I guess there was anyway, because what they did was they fed to these news sites the idea, okay, he's not hurt, but he's got a personal issue. He's got a personal issue that could prevent him from being at the pay-per-view on Sunday. Now, maybe he does have a personal issue, and they found out that he's going to be good to go. My guess is they kind of fed that to keep people wondering if he would or he wouldn't. But it did leak not long after the show last week that his leg was fine. He was just uh, doing a good job of selling because that's what pro wrestlers do. When you're good at your job and you are a good professional wrestler, you can fool people into believing things that aren't real. That's part of the job. That's what makes you good at your job. And so he did a good job of getting a lot of people talking, and myself included last week, when it looked like he may have fucked up his ankle. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But he is very much healthy. He is very much going to be uh, in the three-way on Sunday. Uh, it is kind of silly the way they set this up. Because what he was trying to do, I, I guess the idea was, he wanted Swerve out there so he could lay him out, right? Which is exactly what he did. He knocked him the fuck out with that crutch. But it's not like he called Swerve out to the ring. Swerve came out of all of his own accord. So I don't know if... He would have gone on, like, like, would he have gone on to call him out or, or what? So he happened to come out on his own, and then he took it upon himself to then hit Swerve in the back with a crutch. The whole setup to it was silly, uh, but that's the, the story behind it, is that he wanted to fool him into believing that he wouldn't be there, lower the boom, lay him out, and that's exactly what he did. And by the way, a total heel move by Hangman lying to the fans he convinced the crowd that you know gee you know i got hurt last week i'm not going to be able to wrestle like playing with their emotions only for us to find out five minutes later that he was full of shit lying to the crowd is a heel move and swerve is out there basically giving this guy showing this guy respect which is a babyface move so i don't know if once we get past revolution and once we get past this title match if it's going to just go right back to the way things were for Hangman, or is he going to sustain this, this kind of heel 
version of Hangman, this unhinged heel version who will lie and will cheat and will do whatever he has to do because he's out of his mind. Is this temporary or is this going to be the new Hangman going forward? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It could just be a temporary thing. We'll have to wait and see. But look, the man is obsessed because this man broke into his home and threatened his family, threatened his wife and son. So on the one hand, you can completely understand why he would feel the way that he does, but people like Swerve. So he's going to come out and do stuff like this and get booed because people like the other guy, even though the other guy did something really fucked up. It's wrestling. That's the way it is. Earlier today, the Young Bucks arrived at the building. They said that they were ready to clock in for work. See, they're just like you and me. They come to work. They punch They punch their uh, work card. They go to work. They get off at 5 o'clock. They go home, right? They make a TV dinner. They're no different than you or I, except for a couple of million dollars. They got into the building. Renee just happened to be standing there waiting for them. I guess she just stands there and waits, and the first person who walks in, she's ready to grab an interview. So she asked them about their business meeting last week with Ric Flair. When Ric Flair showed up and he ducked into their dressing room and closed the door, we don't know what they discussed. And Nick said the meeting went well, but that's all that we have to say about that. Matt asked Renee if she had seen Sting yet. She said no. And he goes, since this is his final dynamite, they're dying to see him and thank him for all of his contributions to the company, but really, they want to conduct their exit interview. And they brandished a pair of white baseball bats. And they went off to go hunt for Sting. That was the story throughout the show. The Young Bucks were on the hunt for Sting. They spent the entire show looking for him. I guess they didn't check. They didn't think to check the, uh, the ceiling of the arena. We had Brian Danielson, John Moxley, and Claudio Castagnoli representing the Blackpool Combat Club against Eddie Kingston and FTR in a preview of not one but two matches. On Sunday at Revolution. A few minutes into the match, all six guys ended up fighting at ringside. That took us into a picture-in-picture break. The ringside brawl continued with the Blackpool Combat Club dominating. Uh, There was a second picture-in-picture break a few minutes later. So you know this match had some length to it if they took two breaks. And actually, I think they gave them about 20 minutes. So it was a pretty long match. Kingston eventually tagged in. He put Moxley down with a clothesline. Danielson, though, immediately took him out with a kick. He and Kingston are wrestling on Sunday. Claudio performed the giant swing on Eddie. Moxley followed that up with a pile driver. Moxley had the pin. Dax Harwood slid in to break up the pin at the last second. So the babyfaces fought back. Wheeler hoisted Danielson up on his shoulders, and Dax jumped from the top rope and bulldogged him. And Danielson was dead to rights until Claudio broke things up. Moxley put Harwood in a choke. Danielson and Claudio also applied chokeholds to the other two. Kingston, Harwood, and Wheeler, uh, they fought out of it. They all threw some rapid chops. This was a laugh. This was la- And look, I, I love all the guys involved here. I think they're all great. I'm big fans of everybody involved. But they were showing these chops, and they're all off doing the same move, right? And And... They show Eddie, and he's doing chops, and it's just, it's laughable. Like, these chops were horrible. (laughs) This was, this was awful. Tony Schiavone on commentary said, this is cool. No. No, it's not. FTR dropped Claudio with a shatter machine. Harwood took out Moxley with a brain buster. Then Danielson took out Harwood with a Busaiku knee. Danielson ducked a spinning back fist from Kingston, ended up dropping him with a Busaiku knee. And then Danielson grabbed Kingston by the hands and caved his head in with stomps. And then he transitioned into a triangle sleeper. Referee checked on Kingston and called for the bell. Eddie was clearly out cold. Uh, Kingston did not tap. He napped. He took a little nap. He went nighty-night. And that gave the win to the Blackpool Combat Club. Danielson looked into the camera as they were exiting the ring, and he said, Sunday, Eddie, your ass is getting choked out. They got a little too cute with some things there towards the end. Uh, Otherwise, though, I thought this was the usual good stuff you would expect when you put these six together. Uh, It was a good preview of what we can expect on Sunday with the two matches. 
Now, they aired video footage up next from 30 years ago in CMLL of Chris Jericho tagging with Atlantis. Uh, because tonight, Jericho is wrestling Atlantis Jr. So they were showing us the backstory here. There's a history between his father and Jericho. When Jericho started out in Mexico back in 1993, multiple matches involving him in Atlantis. Uh, most of them tag team matches where they were on the same side. But from 93 to 95, they worked together quite a number of times. And I thought that was a nice touch, being able to get that footage, which they should be able to because now they have a working relationship with CMLL. So I guess it really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if they're working with CMLL and CMLL said, fuck you, you're not, you're not getting footage to use. I'm sure CMLL was more than happy to supply footage of their product on TBS. And uh, I'm glad they had Excalibur explain why this match was at least happening tonight. So Jericho was interviewed by Renee and said that he was thrown in the deep end when he started in Mexico 30 years ago. He mentioned some of the Lucha stars that he worked with. I heard Silver King mentioned. You know who else he mentioned? I heard El Dandy mentioned. There's something about these Canadians. They love them some El Dandy. Who are you to doubt El Dandy? I certainly don't doubt the man. Fucking A, he should be in the Hall of Fame. So he spoke about his friendship with Atlantis Sr. He said he wanted to repay the favor by, I just realized, he said he wanted to re repay the favor by working with his son. I want to repay the favor to you by beating the shit out of your son and trying to rip his mask off, which is what he tried to do during their match. He said that he would give Atlantis Jr. a lesson in violence and show him what Corazon de Leon can do. That's what he called himself in Mexico. And then he spoke some Spanish to close out the interview. How we doing here? How we doing? I sound okay? I sound okay? I hope I sound okay. Again, it's very windy outside. It could be screwing with things. Hopefully everything is good. It's uh, unseasonably warm here in New York. So uh, we, have, we have warm weather and we have 50 mile an hour wind gusts. The most important thing is that I am still connected. As long as the connection is good then we're good. Because if that changes, we got problems. So after a break, uh, Tony Schiavone was in the ring to introduce one of AEW's newest signings, making his very first appearance since signing his AEW contract in November, Will Ospreay, who got a tremendous ovation from the crowd here in Huntsville. Will Ospreay, who also had both of his uh, suitcases lost by Delta Airlines. Welcome to the U.S., Will Osprey. But they did find them. He did actually bring that up during his interview. And he said that they were retrieved. I don't know I don't know where they are. They could be in a completely different city. But they did find his luggage, so, so that's good. So he got a great reaction. He got into the ring. He was wearing a green track suit, probably because whatever he was going to show up in was in his luggage. He said back in November... I told you guys, I asked you, I begged you, let me finish my obligations first with New Japan Pro Wrestling. He goes, my obligations are now done. And everybody cheered. And he said after that, he took a vacation in Barbados with the missus. Now he is here full time. Osprey said he's uh, dressed in a green jumpsuit like Kermit the Frog. He reminded the crowd that he's already had wins in AEW over Orange Cassidy over Kenny Omega, and the first AEW world champion, Chris Jericho. He goes, the territory might be different, but he is ready to pick up where he left off as a member of the Don Callis family. Everybody booed. I don't like Don Callis. And almost as if, like, oh, he heard his name mentioned. Out comes Don Callis, Kanosuke Takeshita, and Powerhouse Hobbs. And he gave Osprey a big hug. There was a sign in the crowd that says, Callus eats yellow snow. There you go. Callus said that there's nothing he likes more than a Callus family reunion. He thanked Osprey for mentioning everything they accomplished together, and they're going to top it by having the match of the decade at Revolution between the Alpha, Kanosuke Takeshita, and Will, by God, Osprey. So this is going to be like Jordan and Pippen going at it in practice and winning all those NBA titles, but it doesn't matter 
who wins a revolution. It's irrelevant because the real winner is going to be the Callus family. And then he asked both men to shake hands. So Osprey extended his hand out and Takeshita stared at it like, yes, that is indeed a hand. And eventually he accepted the handshake. Will went to go walk away and Takeshita pulled him in. And they exchanged some words, some friendly words. And then Takeshita went to go walk off and then Osprey returned the favor and pulled him in. It was getting a little testy there. Callus was oblivious to this in the background. He's smiling, he's laughing. Yeah, shake hands, my men. She could see it was starting to get a little heated between these two. And then the Callus family walked away. Osprey is not going to be tied to them for much longer. I don't know if it will officially end at Revolution or if that's just where the problems are going to begin, but he is not going to be a part of this crew for that much longer because Will Osprey is not going to be a heel or at least position with the other heels. He's not going to be positioned with them for much longer. This man is going to be a babyface. This man should be a babyface. This man is going to be the top babyface in this company by the time this year is over, and probably well before this year is over. He's going to be the top babyface in this company. And it was very encouraging, honestly, to see him get that kind of reaction here in a place where I don't believe he has wrestled before. I didn't know coming in how popular Will Ospreay would be in Huntsville, Alabama, but he was pretty damn over tonight. And so that's an encouraging sign. Um, look, them signing Ospreay was a huge coup for Tony Khan. And people can talk about star power and they can talk about, oh, does he sell tickets though? You know, does he sell tickets? Is he, he going to pop ratings? Maybe in due time he will. We'll find out. We're going to find out in short order. I know one thing, though. This man, you put him in the ring, and he can do things that a normal human being should not be able to do. He can do things in the ring that a lot of wrestlers are not able to do. He goes in there with pretty much every single person he works with, and he elevates their game. And He goes out there, because here's the thing about pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is about more than just the matches and the moves and the holds and the dives and all the flashy stuff. Okay, It's about more than that. It's about the entire package. Can you work? Can you talk? Do you have personality? Are you charismatic? Is there something about you that draws the audience in and makes people want to see you? Right? That's what it's about. Getting people to want to see you, getting people to want to cheer for you or boo you or whatever, but to get them invested and engaged. Will Ospreay has a lot of people invested and engaged. And now he's going to be on weekly television, which is a, a situation that he has not found himself in before. He's been with New Japan for a number of years. They don't have weekly television in the same way the WWE does or AEW does. They have a show on access television, but it's stock footage from months ago. Okay, They don't have a weekly episodic television program like they do here in the States. So now we're going to be exposed to him on a regular basis. And it's going to be up to Tony Khan to program him with people and get him involved in stories that are compelling and are interesting. But when the bell rings, at the end of the day, as important as all that other stuff is, when I'm sitting here and I'm watching a wrestling match for 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes, I want to be entertained. Will Ospreay is better than almost anybody in the world at that right now. That's what he brings to the table for Tony Khan. That was a big feather in his cap being able to sign Will Ospreay. And if, in fact, he has Okada coming in as well, and that's not confirmed, but the belief is that he is going to be signing, if he hasn't already, with AEW, and he's coming in. That's a hell of a one-two punch to steal away from New Japan, Kazuchika Okada and Will Ospreay. And Tony Khan needs that because MJF, we don't know when he's going to be back. Adam Cole, we don't know when he's going to be back in the ring. They've had a lot of injury issues. Kenny Omega, we don't know when he's going to be back. I mean, MJF, Adam Cole, and Kenny Omega, those are three big names that are on the shelf right now. But you bring in Okada and Osprey, that's a nice way to try to fill the void. And that's to say nothing of Mercedes, and she'll be coming in in a few weeks too. So that's a big, big signing for AEW. And I do believe he will be their top baby face in short order. Now, Eddie Kingston was in the back, and he was interviewed by Renee. They were interrupted very quickly by the Bucks. They wanted to know from Eddie if, they had, if he had seen Sting. Nick told Kingston, by the way, he says, uh, you were talking crap about us on Collision, and I'm going to fine you 
the next time you do that. Matt apologized for his brother. He said his brother could be a bit of a hothead. Told Eddie to start dressing like a champion and said maybe they need to implement a dress code. And then the Jacksons, who had their bats with them, they went looking for Sting. And Taz on commentary, you could hear he was feigning concern about dress code. He goes, I worked in a place once before that had a dress code. He sounded worried. Up next was an open challenge for the AEW international title. Orange Cassidy defending his championship against Nick Wayne. Would it have not made more sense to have Daniel Garcia go in there and challenge Nick Wayne? Daniel Garcia is the one who is challenging Christian Cage on Sunday for the TNT title. Would it have not made more sense to put Garcia in there and give him a mountain to climb? (laughs) As big of a mountain as Nick Wayne would be considered. Would it not be more logical to have done that match instead of throwing out four hours before the show? Oh, by the way, we're going to have an open challenge for the international title here. Four hours before the show announcing this four days before he defends against Roddy at the pay-per-view. This match did not need to happen. Wayne sent Cassidy to the floor with a leaping back elbow and then drove Cassidy back first into the ring steps, followed that up with a moonsault from the second rope. Back inside, Cassidy slowly rolled out of the way of whatever Nick was about to go for from the ropes. Uh, Wayne didn't care, though. Wasn't going to stop him. He did a somersault dive out to the floor onto Cassidy. Back inside, Wayne missed the top rope double stomp. He tried for a superplex. Cassidy fought free. Wayne was down, and the referee missed Christian Cage crotching Orange Cassidy because Cage was out there. Kill Switch was out there. Mother Wayne was out there. I don't know why that's just, it's still funny to me whenever they say Mother Wayne. I know she has a name. But, which I I just forgot, actually, what her name is. Uh, Shauna, right? Is it Shauna? Shauna Wayne? Anyway, they're all out there. Referee didn't see Christian uh, crotching him on the top rope. But when the referee turned around, he did see Cage on the apron. And so the referee ejected the entire patriarchy, heading into picture and picture. So Cassidy mounted to come back. Wayne answered with a nice fisherman suplex with a bridge for a two count. And then he started to mock Orange Cassidy with the weak little kicks. Shayna, there you go. Okay, what did I say? Shauna? Shayna, Shauna. Tomato, tomato. What's the difference? We'll just call her Mother Wayne. How about that? So Wayne countered an orange punch. The son, not the mother. Uh, countered an orange punch into a German suplex. Cassidy, though, responded with a beach break for two. So now here come Mike Bennett and Matt Taven. They appear at ringside. They're running distraction as Nick Wayne hit the dragon suplex for a two count. Here comes Rocky Romero and Trent Barretta to ringside. They brawl with the kingdom while Nick Wayne takes uh, one of the top turnbuckle pads off. Until Daniel Garcia shows up to distract Nick Wayne. This allowed Cassidy to hit an orange punch and get the pin. As soon as the match ended, Roderick Strong hit the ring, laid out Cassidy. Quickly bailed, though, when Romero and Beretta made the save. The match was good. I mean, you know, the match was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. Uh, The problem is nobody watched it. Not one person. There isn't a single person in the world who watched this match. If you say you did, you're a liar who watched this match four days before Revolution and this title match that they have been promoting for the last six weeks and thought for a split second that that international title was going to change hands. So it was a match for the sake of doing a match. It got them all on the show. I still maintain that doing Garcia against Wayne would have made more sense. And then you could do something else on the show. The the whole objective here was to get Roddy in there to assault Orange Cassidy, right? And then he got chased away. And there's any number of things you could have done on this show in another segment, whether it be a match, whether it be an interview segment, a backstage segment, any number of things you could have done to accomplish that. I just think from a match perspective, it was dumb to throw this out there at the last second, and that would have been the match that made more sense. Renee was in the back, 
and Renee interviewed the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. Jay White, The Guns, Billy Gunn, Max Caster, Anthony Bowman. Jay White said, you know, he was a bit apprehensive about this partnership at first, but now he's all in on the group. And Billy Gunn then asked Caster, hey, what was up with your rap on Collision? Because if you didn't see it, Max Caster uh, fucked up his rap. He, he just As he was coming down to the ring midway through the rap, he just forgot what he was supposed to say and gave up. It happens. It's embarrassing when it happens on live TV, but it happens. So now they just brought it up to poke fun at it. Caster said, you think anybody noticed? And then they quickly moved on from it. So Austin Gunn suggested that he team up with the Acclaimed on Collision. And Bowens then suggested that the acclaimed team with Austin and the other members like that idea. So this is the running gag, where Austin Gunn will make a suggestion, and everybody will either ignore him or they won't really like the idea, but then somebody else in the group pitches basically the exact same idea, and everybody likes it. That's the running gag. Uh, I hate this. I hate this. I really do. I cannot wait for this to end. This cannot end soon enough. So that we can get heel Jay White back because whatever version of Jay White that we are seeing here fucking sucks and I hate it. That's how I feel. Whatever the hell this is, I can't wait for it to be over. We had Chris Statlander one-on-one -on -one with Sky Blue. Statlander entered with Willow Nightingale and Stokely Hathaway in her corner. She wants nothing to do with Stokely. Stokely has been trying to recruit this woman now for the past few months. He has befriended Willow Nightingale to try to get to Chris Statlander and win her over. That's the basic story. So they all come out together. There was a cool spot early where Statlander pulled Sky Blue off the apron with a gorilla press and then launched her into the front row, and she wiped out a couple of planted fans. Statlander was a house of fire until a rolling neckbreaker put Blue back on offense. Both women fought to the apron. They traded some kicks. Statlander, though, hit a German suplex on the apron. And Sky Blue hit hard and then rolled down to the floor. Julia Hart was out there. She was in Sky Blue's corner. And she and Willow tended to their partners until both women had a face-off. Sky Blue hit a drop toe hold on Statlander into the steps. And then back inside, she hit a Canadian Destroyer and got an inside cradle for two. Stokely tried to pass Statlander a steel chain, and Statlander didn't really want to have anything to do with that. She was very hesitant. Willow was out there going, don't do it, don't accept it, and she didn't, but she probably should have because she ended up losing because she did not take the chain. She did not use it as a weapon. She wanted to be the honorable one, and look what happened to her here in this match. Referee was reprimanding Stokely Hathaway, and while that was happening, Julia Hart blasted Statlander with the TBS title. And then Sky Blue hit Code Blue, and she stole the win. So the story continues between uh, Statlander and Stokely, and will she, won't she accept him as her manager, her agent, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there was some good stuff in the second half of this uh, that I enjoyed. So, again, not, neither of these women, I don't believe, are scheduled for a match on Sunday. But the match, I thought, was a pretty decent match here. We went back to the Bucks in the back. Back to the Bucks in the back. Sure. They were backstage, still searching for Sting, and they came upon a dressing room that they believed to be his or were told belonged to him. And they were a little hesitant before they walked in. But when they opened the door, the room was empty. There was no sting. Instead, what they found was baseball bats. A bunch of black baseball bats hanging from, from strings on the ceiling. And that was it. And there was a mirror. Now, at least it wasn't Hogan looking in the mirror and seeing Warrior in his reflection Nitro Goofy. It wasn't quite that bad, but this was kind of stupid. I mean, look, if you're trying to play mind games, okay, which clearly that was the idea here. Sting is playing mind games. If you want to play mind games here, why don't you hang some real bats in the room? I'm not talking baseball bats. I mean, actual bats like Batman. 
Hang those in the locker room. I bet you when they open the door and those bats come flying at them, they're not going to want to fuck with this guy anymore. I know I wouldn't. No, it's a bunch of baseball bats. They're already walking around with baseball bats. What exactly was this supposed to accomplish here? At least try to scare them. Try to, try to put the fear of God into these two. Do something. Baseball bats hanging from the ceiling. Very good. You know what I would do if I walked into a room and I saw that? I would close the door and I would go on my way. We got Lionheart, Chris Jericho. A shout out to Aaron, who is joining us here. Aaron just gifted five channel memberships and dropped a 20 spot. Aaron, it's good to hear from you, brother. And congrats to all of our new members. Always very cool to see more green in the live chat. But we got Lionheart, Chris Jericho in his throwback pants and vest, and he had the old music that he would come out to. No Judas tonight. Imagine being the two people in that crowd who paid their good money to go to Dynamite so they could sing Chris Jericho's song, and instead he came out to another song. What are these people going to do now? They're going to have to sing Judas to themselves now on the car ride home. He took on Atlantis Jr., who had his father, Atlantis Sr., in his corner. Now, this was my first time seeing Atlantis Jr., and I wasn't impressed. Now, maybe I'm just spoiled by all of the great luchadors that we get to see on this show on most weeks. You know, this is a company that has Penta and Ray Phoenix, and look, we, we've seen other luchadors come in from CMLL, and we've seen luchadors from other places in the independent scene. We've got Vikingo, and we have Commander, and we have all these different people who go out there and they do these incredible things. Maybe I'm just spoiled. I don't know. But what I saw here, I don't, and again, I don't know if he's supposed to be a big deal. I know his father is obviously a very esteemed name in Lucha Libre, right? I've heard of Atlantis before. I don't know if it was really just a case of Jericho wanting to wrestle Atlantis's son, and this is there's Atlantis Jr., which is really all about the father, or if he's supposed to be a big deal. But if he is, I didn't see it. He looked very tentative in a lot of his uh, early stuff here in the match. There were some things that came off very awkward. He he gave Jericho like two or three monkey flips. One of them was all fucked up. But even doing those, you know, he's very kind of slow and tentative. And on the third attempt at a monkey flip, Jericho countered into the walls. Atlantis, though, quickly got to the ropes. Jericho tried to unmask him until Aubrey Edwards put a stop to that. That allowed Atlantis Sr. to lure Jericho over to the ropes. And he choked him for a while with his towel. The towel that would come into play a little bit later on. That led to Atlantis Jr. hitting a dive and a slingshot into the post. Atlantis wanted a powerbomb onto the ring steps. Almost dropped Jericho the first time, so that was a fumble. Tried again. Got Jericho up. And Jericho basically flipped out of it. Did a Hurricane Rana. Sent Atlantis face first into the ring steps. That took us into the picture-in-picture -picture break. Atlantis regained control during the break. Cut Jericho off with a top rope arm drag. Atlantis got a wheelbarrow German suplex for another near fall. He struggled, though, setting that up. Again, it was very very tentative, very slow. Eventually, he pulled it off, but I don't know, just not very fluid. And I think part of it is, frankly, that I'm just very spoiled by how, how easy so many of these luchadors make it look. You know, we've seen so many matches with people like Vikingo. And Vikingo is... Vikingo is an extreme example because Vikingo is kind of like what, in, in many ways, what Rey Mysterio was many, many years ago, where you have luchadors and you have guys that will be able to pull off these amazing maneuvers and spots and dives. But then you have somebody like Vikingo who goes out there and he just puts a little something extra on it. And he's got some moves in his arsenal that, again, he should not be able to do. And the speed that he does it at, every now and then a guy will come along who's just a little bit different. Right? He's, he's cut from a different cloth than everybody else. And we've seen so much of that here that I feel like the game has been upped so much that when I see somebody who probably was perfectly serviceable, I'm actually 
disappointed. I think that's what's going on. So they both ended up on the top rope together. Jericho dropped him with what I guess was supposed to be, they said, an avalanche bulldog. It looked more like just a basic face buster. You know, devastating, but okay. Not really a bulldog. Atlantis recovered, though. He caught Jericho charging in with a snap power slam and then followed that up with a dive to the outside. Uh, for the finish, Jericho got him in the walls. Atlantis almost got to the ropes, but Jericho pulled him back to the center of the ring, and then he applied the lion tamer. He pulled back just a little bit more. And then Atlantis Sr. takes the towel that he had around his neck and tosses it into the ring. He threw in the towel, and I'm thinking, what a fucking lame finish. And the referee called for the bell, and Jericho was awarded the win. Now, they tried to explain it. They tried to explain it that the father was saving his son because he knew his son would never surrender. Right? That's the story they were trying to tell. The problem is, Jericho barely had the hold applied for three seconds before he threw in the towel. You would think you would wait a little while, right? Build some drama here. Get a tight camera shot of Atlantis Sr. Looking into the ring at his son, his son with pain on his face, screaming and trying to reach for the rope, but he won't give up. And the father is telling him, hang on, hang on. And then after 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, he finally throws in the towel, right? That would make more sense to me. Now, he locks on the lion tamer, immediately throws the towel in, and the referee calls for the bell, and it made his son look like a chump. That's what it happened. That's what happened here. It made his son look like a chump. So when the match was over, Jericho checked on Junior, helped him to his feet, uh, before having words with Atlanta Senior, and then they hugged. And, and look, it got better as it went on. The beginning of this was very rough because of Atlantis. It got better as it went on. Uh, I was not a fan of this. The people in the arena, I will say, the people in the building in Huntsville were into the match. At one point, they even chanted, this is <laughs> this is awesome. Hey, different strokes for different folks, I guess. I guess, you know, hey, some people, some people, their, their, their level of awesome is different from others, I guess. Uh, not a word I would use to describe this match. But the finish was ridiculous. The finish was ridiculous. The instant throwing of the towel was so was so stupid. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. Unless he just, you know, was he supposed to wait a little while and he just, you know, got all wrapped up in the moment? I don't know. Atlantis has been around for a while. He's a veteran of the business. I don't think that, you know, he would forget something like that. So I assume it was designed that way and uh, it was stupid. So the Blackpool Combat Club, I wanted to mention this. They're going to be working Arena Mexico next month. Yeah, we had the CMLL Invaders come to AEW Television. Well, now the Blackpool Combat Club is going to Arena Mexico at the end of next month for a show. And they're doing a tag match on that show. Uh, and it makes me wonder if we're going to get Jericho going to Arena Mexico again. Nothing has been announced, but I do wonder, like, based on what they did here, talking about his history in CMLL, I wouldn't be shocked at all if Jericho ends up working that Arena Mexico show. Then it was time for the main event, and I was kind of pissed because I was looking forward. I thought Sting was going to come out. Here's what I thought was going to happen. I thought Sting was going to come out. They were going to leave him enough time at the end of the show to come out and cut a promo. Cut a heartfelt promo to really drive home the importance of this final match coming up at Revolution. And I looked at the clock and I saw it was 9.55. And I said, we're not getting the promo here. So whatever they were going to do, either they're running low on time or they just have something very quick planned here for the end. But this was not the segment I was hoping to get. I mean, again, people are going to talk about the very end with him coming down and how cool it was. And yeah, it's a cool visual. But I was hoping for more. I was hoping for that one last hard sell. Uh, and to get to hear from Sting. And that's the one thing I did not like about this last segment. We didn't get that. But the Bucks came out. They have new music. There were some Sting fans in the front row wearing Sting masks. I thought back to those couple of times over the years, right? Once in WCW and once in TNA, where we had Sting 
revealed to be wearing a sting mask, which will never not be funny to me. I was kind of hoping we would get that here, but that would have been a little too obvious, I guess, right? If if the Bucks go out there, the first thing they're going to think is Sting must be under the mask, right? So they didn't do that. It's the amazing Goonthar. Oh, it's Goonthar. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar. The Look who it is. All hail Goonthar. It is Goonthar, the amazing one himself, courtesy of our boy Aaron. Hey, Aaron, thank you, man. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for the memberships. Let me get to your messages here and your questions in just a little bit. So uh, get them on in. But Aaron, again, thank you very much, brother. So the Bucks see some fans in the front row wearing Sting masks. One of them unmasks, and it's not Sting. It's Sting Jr. It's Darby Allen. And Darby goes after the Bucks. They got the better of him, though. They get him in the ring, and they start assaulting him with their baseball bats. Like, they're beating this man down. And then they set him up for the EVP trigger, and they hit it. No save. Lights don't go out. I thought Sting had the ability to make the lights go out. Apparently, he didn't care enough about his boy Darby here to put the lights out, to give him a chance to, you know, escape or uh, make a comeback. So they wrecked him with the EVP trigger. Down he went. And then we get Ric Flair's music. And Ric Flair walks slowly down the aisle. He takes his jacket off. He flashes a thumbs up to the Bucks in the ring. He climbs into the ring. Matt Jackson hands him a baseball bat. And now they're holding Darby. And instead of hitting Darby with the baseball bat, Rick drops the bat instead. He starts attacking the Bucks with punches. He is fighting the young Bucks until Nick Jackson delivers Ric Flair's kryptonite, uh, which, other than alimony, is a low blow from behind. Oh, I guess you can call the alimony payments a low blow of their own. But he delivers a low blow to Ric Flair. 40 years, right? Probably almost 50 in the business. You would think Ric Flair would have some sort of counter for the nut shots at this point, but he doesn't. So down he goes, and they start putting the boots to Ric Flair. Now we hear Sting's music. And by the way, Flair looked fucking ancient out there. Having him do anything physical in the ring is a bad idea. I know he wants it. Just because he wants it doesn't mean that you need to give it to him. But now we hear Sting's music. And the Bucks are ready for got their baseball bats, they get out of the ring, and they go up the ramp, and they wait just, just before the stage, right? And they're waiting for him to come out. And now, all of a sudden, behind them, you can hear the crowd stirring, and the camera cuts to the roof of the building, and we see Sting in the long trench coat, like it's 1997 on Nitro, being lowered from the ceiling all the way down to the floor. And everybody is losing their minds because, of course, they're having flashbacks to their childhood. They're having flashbacks to the Monday Night War. Sting comes down. He unhooks himself. And the Bucks run back down to the ring. Sting, though, he's got a baseball bat. He takes them both out with bat shots. Darby goes up to the top rope. He dives off. He takes out both Bucks with a coffin drop. He takes Nick Jackson, picks him up, throws him in the ring. Sting climbs into the ring, and Sting then drops him with a scorpion death drop. And that was the segment. They played his music. That's how they went off the air. I was disappointed in that I was hoping for more out of what was billed as his farewell on Dynamite. Now, we may get a promo from Sting after his match in Greensboro. In fact, I would be shocked if we don't hear from Sting on the microphone, win or lose, in Greensboro on Sunday. Even when Ric Flair had his final match, when the match was over, they put a mic in his hand and he cut one heartfelt promo for the, you know, all the people who were there. Probably couldn't remember a fucking thing that happened because, as he would later admit, he passed out during the match. That whole thing is still an embarrassment. I'm sure we'll hear from Sting on Sunday, but it would have been nice to have that last go-home sell from him and him and Darby together in the ring and and him just talking about what this means to him, what this journey has been. And, you know, what they're planning on doing to the box when they get to Greensboro on Sunday. We didn't get that. And I can see where some people would be disappointed in that because, again, that was the big segment that was really hyped up for the show tonight. 
Uh, the visual of Sting being lowered from the ceiling, though, you know, again, if you think back to the NWO days, uh, that was a cool visual. Still very surprised to see them do that, considering uh, that they're the ones working with with Martha and the Owen Hart Foundation. And I do wonder if, as a courtesy, he would have said to her, hey, look, we're thinking about doing this. You know, we want to do this on the show. Just wanted to run it by you. Yeah, I, I just, because again, it's such a, it's a, it's a, sticky subject there i when i see something like that yes i think of sting from 97 but again given the gravity of what happened how can you not how can you not think of that you know what happened in 99 and it's not something that i honestly want to be reminded of so that surprised me but everybody went nuts for it i don't think that's what was on the people's mind certainly in the building uh, tonight uh but what was hilarious to me it was still hilarious to me to see Sting take a sweet time and allow his friends to get their asses kicked until he was ready to make his grand entrance. That will never not be funny to me. It's kind of a wrestling trope. Like we, We've seen that in wrestling over the years. Partners, people will come out, they'll get beat down and beat down and beat down until the music plays. And then the person can come out and make the save. Or like when Jeff Hardy made his uh, debut. Was it his debut? Might have been his debut in AEW. And his brother was getting his ass handed to him. Remember what Jeff Hardy did when he came out? Matt Hardy is getting the shit kicked out of him. And Jeff Hardy is in the, he's on the ramp. I think he had a chair in his hand. And he's got to do the Jeff Hardy dance. He's got to dance first. Sorry, bro. Sorry, bro. I got to dance first, right? I mean, it's fucking, it's hilarious because it's so stupid. If I did that to a friend of mine, we wouldn't be friends anymore. In wrestling, though, all is forgiven. That was Dynamite. Not a bad show. Obviously, there were parts of it I didn't like. I thought the key matches, uh, they you know did a, a good job, a decent job in some cases, of hyping up for Sunday. It set the table for a lot of those matches on Sunday. I still think there were a couple of matches, including the Jericho match, that did not need to be on the show. Let's take a look at the Twitter poll, then we're going to get into these revolution predictions. But here's what you guys thought of the show tonight, with almost a 1,000 votes in. Again, we're doing them on a rating scale now, star ratings. 35% give this show four stars. 32.7% three stars. 13% two stars. And almost 20% gave this show one star. At Solomonster. Vote on what you thought of the Dynamite Before Revolution. Back to me. Let's talk about Revolution because the pay-per-view is coming up on Sunday from the Greensboro Coliseum. I don't know what the current exact total is, but the last I checked, WrestleTix, they were up right around 16,000 tickets sold, which is a huge crowd for an AEW show. Uh, that's not at you know Wembley Stadium or a big, big place like that. That's a big crowd. That's a very healthy crowd. The thing about that is the majority of those tickets were sold weeks ago. It's not like, oh, they just got up into the 14, 15, 16,000 range. They've been there for a few weeks. This is all about Sting's retirement. That is the main attraction. That is the main event of this show. It is not the AEW World title match. The main event of this show, make no mistake about it, is Sting's match. People want to be there because... This is the only time you're going to be able to go and say, hey, I was at Sting's final match. It's an attraction. But let's start from the beginning of the card here. Now, they were supposed to have a Meat Madness match. We don't know what the fuck a Meat Madness match was supposed to be other than probably putting a bunch of big guys in the ring. They announced Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Lance Archer. Lance Archer. Powerhouse Hobbs. Wardlow. Two men in Wardlow and Hobbs who really can't afford to lose right now, and Lance Archer, a man who all he does is lose. So it seemed pretty obvious to me that Archer was in there to take the loss from Wardlow, and that would protect Hobbs. But then we found out from Tony Khan in a tweet earlier today that because of injuries and people not being medically cleared, Meat Madness, he said, is on ice. There would be no Meat Madness at a later date, they would have the match. And I'm thinking, well, I wonder who's hurt. I hope it's not Wardlow. We just saw him last week cutting a promo. Is it Archer? Like, what's the issue here? You know. But then they announced that in place of 
Meet Madness, they're having a what they're calling an all-star scramble match, which is basically just the way to say we're just going to put a whole bunch of people in a match. I don't know what the rules are, but they're calling it an all-star scramble. But here's the weird part about it. Three of the men in the all-star scramble are Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Lance Archer. What the fuck? <laughs> I don't get it. So was the idea that they were going to add a whole bunch of people to meet Madness beyond those three? Because they were they were billing it and talking about it like it was going to be those three guys. And yet they're in the new match. So that's very weird to me. I have no idea why they had to make the change if that was the case. But they did. And so now we're getting Wardlow, Hobbs, Archer. Chris Jericho has been added because you got to have him on the card. So now Jericho is in the All-Star Scramble. We also, well, who else did they advertise here? Hold on. Brian Cage, Hook, and there's two open spots. One of those open spots will be decided in a three-way match on Collision with Penta, Brian Keith, and Dante Martin. And I had to do a double take when I saw that because I said, wait a minute. Collision. Penta. Penta is in the main event of our House of Glory show on Saturday. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then I realized, oh, okay, Collision is being taped tonight. I almost had a fucking heart attack for a second. How can the man be in two places at once? That's not possible. All is well. So I don't even know all the names in this match, but Wardlow is in it. So Wardlow should win. You can't have Wardlow go out there on TV last week and cut that impassioned promo and then go out on the pay-per-view and lose. So he should win. I don't know who the final two spots are going to be, but it should be Wardlow going over in that match. Now, FTR is going to be taking on John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli. Or uh, John Moxley and Claudio are going to be taking on FTR. This is coming off their time limit draw. They had a 20-minute time limit draw last week. Uh, the Blackpool Combat Club, they're the ones who are currently at war with the CMLL crew. Uh, I, could, I could potentially see BCC and FTR, once their little feud is over here, coming together, joining forces, and then all of them end up competing against the CMLL talent. Maybe they all show up at Arena Mexico. As far as who wins here, I think Moxley and Claudio get the win. I again, it could go either way. If it were me, I'd have FTR go over. They're they're the real team. I just feel like they're going to give BCC a win to keep them strong going into uh, Arena Mexico. We have Orange Cassidy defending the AEW International Title against Roderick Strong of the Undisputed Kingdom, the very mediocre Undisputed Kingdom. If Roddy does not win the international title in this match, disband the fucking group. Just disband them and move on. If you can't beat Orange Cassidy and win the international title, forget the world title, if you can't beat this guy at Revolution, you're done. That's it. He has to win. There is no scenario in which Roderick Strong should be losing this match. What else is left for Orange Cassidy to do? This is his second reign with this title. They are running the exact same story they did before, where he has the open challenge, he welcomes all comers, he's running himself ragged. I'm tired. Remember, he always told Renee before, before he lost the title the first time, I'm tired. I'm hurt. I'm beat up. It's the same shit. That coupled with the fact that the kingdom need a big win, Roddy goes over in this match. Period. End of story. There can be no other outcome. Will Ospreay, one-on-one, -on -one, in his official AEW in-ring debut since signing that full-time deal, takes on Kanosuke Takeshita. Both men obviously are affiliated with the Don Callis family. Will that still be the case when this match is over? Uh, I don't know if it'll be an immediate thing, but I don't see this lasting uh, much longer as far as this alliance, this partnership with Ospreay and the Callis family, because I do see him uh, going babyface very soon. You know, it's still a reach, the explanation they had Callus give about how I'm going to take two of my men and have them beat each other up at Revolution, and they're going to have the match of the year. And then when it's over, it won't matter, because they'll still be a part of the Callus family. 
eh, kind of a dumb excuse. But we are getting a match that is going to be all kinds of awesome. You know, look, I can't, I can't hate on doing Osprey and Takeshita. That is going to be a fantastic match. It is one of the two matches I am most looking forward to on this show on Sunday. And really, I'm looking forward to a few different matches. But the top two would be the main event, because it is Sting's last match, and this. Those two. Christian Cage defends the TNT Championship against Daniel Garcia. Uh, Christian took out Adam Copeland with a concerto a few weeks ago on TV that put him on the shelf. That paved the way for Garcia to get the title shot. He comes into this match at a disadvantage. There's a numbers disadvantage that he is at. Even if he has uh, Daddy Magic watching his back, that ain't going to do shit. You put Daddy Magic up against the dinosaur, yeah, that, that's not really going to help much. Now, I would be very surprised if Adam Copeland is not going to be there on Sunday. Because I think, first of all, I think he's going to want to be there anyway. Uh, because it's Sting's final match. So I think he's going to want to be in the building regardless. But I think we're definitely going to get uh, an Adam Copeland appearance on Sunday. And I think not only is he going to be there to help even the odds, but I think we're getting a title change. I think Daniel Garcia is going to be the new TNT champion. Because he has been slowly getting over since the Continental Classic. And, and you know, even before that, people like the dumb little dance that he did or that he does. But really, since the Continental Classic, people have been starting to get behind him. And they obviously are very high on him, the way he's been pushed ever since he debuted. We used to joke here on these streams, because he was in the main event every single week. We used to call him Main Event Garcia. He got more main events than some of the actual main eventers on the show. And that told you right there what they think of him. And what the top guys in the company who wanted to work with him, what they think of him. Brian Danielson, I know, is very high on he fit right in. He would fit a lot better than Wheeler Yuta would in the Blackpool Combat Club. They wanted to swap those two out. So I think he's going to win the TNT title. I would make the move. I don't think that Copeland and Christian need the TNT title. They don't. They're going to continue their feud. They're going to have their blow off, probably in Vegas at Devil or Nothing. It does not need to be for the TNT title. Copeland already won it for five minutes, but he won it. So the story of him wanting to hold gold for the first time since 2011. He did. He did. Right? So he doesn't have to be the TNT champion. Let those two go off and have their match in May at Double or Nothing. Garcia wins the title. Eddie Kingston is going to put his Continental title on the line against Brian Danielson. And if Kingston wins, Danielson must shake his hand. He must show his respect for this man and shake his hand when the match is over. Uh, Danielson beat Eddie early in the Continental Classic. Eddie came back and he got a win back over Danielson. Then he went on to win the entire thing. Uh, so between these two, it's a respect thing. They don't like each other. I think Danielson made that very clear on the show tonight. So it's going to get nasty. It's going to be stiff uh, between these two. And I expect Eddie to retain. And Danielson will be a man of his word. And when the match is over, he'll go over begrudgingly, but he will go over and he will shake Eddie Kingston's hand. Danielson is winding down as a full-time performer. He has said that, I think, Wembley, right, it all in, is really going to mark the end of this current full-time run that he's on. And from that point on, he plans to wrestle a handful of matches each year, probably for the rest of his life. He said he'll never retire. Uh, he'll always wrestle. He'll probably want to go to different places, travel to different parts of the world. He'll basically do what he wants to do. But in these remaining months that he has here as a full-time performer in this company, I don't see him winning a title, not a singles title, and he doesn't need to. I would have loved to have seen Brian Danielson as the AEW world champion, and he had a couple of chances at it. He wrestled Hangman, he wrestled MJF. It didn't work out. He does not need to be champion. He does not need a title. He's title-proof. All he needs to do is go around and work with the people that he wants to work with and have great matches. There's nothing that there's nothing to be gained at this point from putting the title on him. And Eddie Kingston, he just won it at World's End. He went through an entire tournament. Their G1 to become the Continental Champion. It's too soon for him to drop that title. 
just doesn't make sense for them to do a title change in that match. So Eddie is going to win, especially when you uh, look at what they did tonight. It was Danielson who left him laying. It was Danielson who put him down. And he went nighty night. That's not going to happen on Sunday. We got timeless Tony Storm defending her AEW Women's World Championship against Deanna Perrazzo. There are two names who I see potentially dethroning timeless Tony Storm. Deanna Perrazzo is not one of those names. It's either going to be Mariah May or it's going to be Jamie Hayter when Hayter comes back. I have not heard anything about Jamie Hayter, which makes me a very sad panda because I was hoping by now either she would be back or we would be hearing about it. So any of these people that are going to be in that scrum on Sunday asking their questions, ask about Jamie Hayter. I'd like for some kind of a status update on that. But I think it's one of those two. It's not going to be Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, I have not been terribly impressed with her matches so far, you know, it could just be that she really has not had the chance to go out there yet and have that one big epic match. Now she's going to have her shot. Tony Storm is a friend of hers. Tony Storm is somebody that she's worked with before. She's very familiar with. So there's already a familiarity there between these two. It's on pay-per-view. They're going to be in a very big spot. Right now, it's the only women's match on the show. They may add something late. You know, Tony Khan likes to add four matches to the pre-show the day before. So there may end up being a women's match, like a tag match, maybe on the pre-show. But spotlight's on them. This is a chance for her to go out there and have the kind of match that she just hasn't really had yet so far. And she's only been here for a month, maybe. But I'm expecting good things from those two. I think that's going to be a very good match. We have Samoa Joe defending the AEW World Championship in a three-way match. We now know it will, in fact, still be a three-way. Between him, Hangman Adam Page, and Swerve Strickland, I do not see Samoa Joe losing the title this soon. It would be a sin for his run to end abruptly this week. Swerve Strickland will be the AEW World Champion at some point. This will not be the weekend that they pull the trigger and put the belt on him. I think that this just insatiable hunger for revenge and to prevent this man from ever becoming champion that Hangman feels for Swerve is going to play directly into the finish of this match. And I laid it out a few weeks ago. There's going to be some kind of a finish here where it becomes more important for Hangman to make sure Swerve doesn't win and he loses than it is for him himself to win. Like, that to him is more important than anything else. Just making sure this guy does not get that title. And if that means that there is a, a sequence at the end of the match where maybe there's dueling submissions, right? Joe's got the coquina clutch. Swerve looks like he's about to tap. Or, or rather, the other way around. Joe looks like he's about to tap. Hangman's stuck, maybe, in some kind of a, of a hold. And he's like, I can't let this happen. I could see him willingly tapping out or verbally submitting just to make sure that Swerve does not walk out of there with that title. But however they do it, pinfall, submission, whatever they do, that I think is going to be the finish that they put together here. And it's going to result in Samoa Joe walking out with the championship. And Hangman will get his way. He will make sure that Swerve does not walk out with that AEW world title. And just because he doesn't does not mean that he won't at some point this year. But I also think that Swerve is not going to be the one to get pinned or submit. It's going to be Hangman taking that losing fall. And then in the main event, it's Sting and Darby Allin defending the AEW World Tag Team titles against the brothers Buck, Matthew, and Nicholas Jackson in the main event. This is it. This is it. After a nearly 40-year career from the Blade Runners, to being in this very building at the Greensboro Coliseum in that 45-minute classic with Ric Flair and all the classic matches this man has had with Flair and with Vader and with so many people over the years. that you, I mean, you could think of all the opponents this man has had, Cactus Jack, Hulk Hogan, Diamond Dallas Page, Goldberg, Bret Hart, Kurt Angle, all the men that this man, is, this man has been in the ring with. 
all the generations that like it crosses over into. It's just crazy to think about the longevity that he has had in his career. And it all culminates on Sunday. And I'm very sad. You know, it, it's, it's, as somebody who grew up, I knew who Sting was. I was more of a WWF guy than a WCW guy, but Sting was one of my favorites because he looked cool. Right? The face paint, the flat top, what's not to like? And it all comes to an end on Sunday. This is it. So what is he going to want to do? Because you know that he's going to want to do something crazy in this match. And uh, I shudder to think what that might be. But who goes over? Uh, the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks are going to be the new AEW Tag Team Champions. If what we have heard is true, that Tony Khan has been very deferential to Sting as far as letting him uh, you know, do what he wants or have the opponents. I know some people don't buy this whole notion that he picked the Bucks. So, I mean, do you really think that Tony Khan foisted this upon him? Look at the way Tony Khan has treated Sting from the moment he came into this company. In 2020, he's undefeated. He has never lost a single match his entire run in AEW so far. They call him the icon. They treat him like that. They treat him as a legend. They treat him with such reverence. Do you honestly believe that if Sting had a certain opponent in mind, Tony Khan would say, would tell him, "No, we're not doing that. We're going with the Bucks," or even the people that don't like the Bucks, that the Bucks would politic their way into getting the match against the wishes of what Sting wants. I mean, the, the conspiracy theories that I have heard have really, I mean, they have really been whacked out, like, out of this world. Yes, I do believe that Sting wanted the Young Bucks as his opponents. And why not? Why wouldn't he? They worked together once before. Sting was said to have had a great time working with them at that first Forbidden Door show, but he knows that the Bucks are going to go in there they can bump for him. They could sell for him. Whatever he can do, whatever his 64-year-old body has left in it, they are going to make him look like a million bucks. No pun intended. Is it really that much of a stretch to believe that he wanted the young bucks as his final opponents? So Tony Khan has given that to him. And I think we're also going to see a whole bunch of people from Sting's career. We know Kevin Nash is not going to be there, but Ric Flair is going to be there. Uh, I'll bet you anything that Lex Luger will probably be sitting there in the front row and maybe even some other people from Sting's career. I think Tony Khan is going to want to go all out because it's the way he's booked him from the very beginning. This is not just going to be a regular match. So what I'm hoping is that secretly they were able to make, and I know it's, it's probably not going to happen, but I am holding out hope that they were able to reach some kind of an agreement with WWE where they can have access to footage from Sting's career that they can use in one final video package as part of his retirement. Because that would be the cool thing. That would be the that would be something I think the fans would enjoy. I think it would be something that Sting himself would enjoy. And maybe it's just me being overly optimistic, but that's what I would like to see might not happen. Now, I could see them working out some kind of an arrangement with TNA and having access to his TNA footage. But I'm sure whatever Tony Khan has planned is going to be very, very special. Because he loves Sting. He's a huge Sting mark. And guess what? I bet you there are a lot of people in this live chat right now who are big Sting marks. I'll be marking out for Sting one last time on Sunday. Hopefully he'll uh, be healthy and he won't hurt himself and he'll be able to go out the way that he wants to because that's the biggest thing about this. His run in WWE did not end the way that he wanted it to. It looked like that was going to be it. Nobody wants their career to end that way. Now, I was looking at Big E when he was in Vegas for the, the WrestleMania 40 press conference a few weeks ago and I'm so happy to see him happy and healthy and doing well but you know that like that's not the way he wants his career to end. And it, it unfortunately, it may end that way. There are a lot of guys like that. Edge thought his career was over for nine fucking years. And then he was able to come back. Brian Danielson was retired for three years. Thought his career might be over. He was able to come back. Sting was able to come back. Now he gets to write his final chapter the way that he wants it to be written. And that's going to be a very cool moment. The Bucks going over. I think Sting is old school. 
I don't think he's going to want to get the win. If it's true that Tony Khan will give Sting what he wants, I can't imagine Sting saying, I'm going over. I just can't picture it. Especially now that they have the belts. Might have been a little bit different if the idea was that they win the belts in Greensboro. Get that big moment and then surrender the belts and you put them up in a tournament. The fact that they already have the belts, they're not going to do that. You know, I mean, the Bucks, they're getting this new heel gimmick over. They're going to get the belts. They're going to get the belts on Sunday. And that's fine. Again, that's the old school mentality. And then uh, you know, we'll probably get that Sting promo at the very end of the night. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a very emotional thing for a lot of the uh, people in the building, but it's going to be a very cool moment. I'm glad that Sting is uh, going to get the chance to go out this way uh, because for a while there, it did not look like that was going to be the case. And I'm also very hopeful that because of the angle they did tonight where it looked like Ric Flair was going to had turned on them, but then instead he went after the Bucks. Uh, that that means that we're not going to get Flair costing Sting the match on Sunday, which is still possible. But I think the fact that they did that angle tonight, hopefully that means that they're not going to just have Flair turn on Sting on Sunday. Wouldn't be the first time, though, that Sting fell for the horseman fucking over. But that's your Revolution card. I, of course, uh, am going to be live as soon as Revolution is over. Uh, which probably won't be until midnight on uh, or after midnight on Sunday. These AEW pay-per-views are very, very long. Uh, I actually think the card on paper is very, very strong. This is one of the strongest lineups they have had for a pay-per-view on paper in a very long time. And they had this lineup mostly figured out and announced weeks ago. This was not one of those times like they've done so many times before where it's the week of the show and we know two matches. Right? We've known pretty much the entire card now for at least a month. And uh, I hope that's a change we see more often with AEW, where they don't wait until the very last minute to announce everything. But that'll be coming up on Sunday night. So you get two podcasts on Sunday. You'll get episode 851. Uh, that'll drop sometime in the afternoon. And then the uh, Revolution recap on Sunday night. Before that, though, a couple of things I want to mention here before I get to your uh, Super Chats. Those of you uh, may be familiar with another YouTube channel <clears throat> by the name of Good Mike Work Commentaries. And uh, Greg is a friend of mine. I got to meet him uh, actually on the Jericho Cruise a number of years ago. It was the first time we met in person. And uh, Greg is a good guy. And he reached out to me a while back and said, hey, we should collaborate and do something fun for WrestleMania season. He's going to be doing a whole month of WrestleMania content on his channel, so you should go subscribe and check that out. We have uh, something that we put together uh, the other day. It's going to be dropping on his channel on Friday. So Friday at noon, uh, go check out our little collab. That's right. Perfect sound effect. But yes, go check out Good Mic Work Friday at noon Eastern. You can uh, go check out what we put together. I hope you guys enjoy it. Also, uh, coming up on Saturday, something fun. House of Glory. House of Glory Reckoning from the NYC Arena in Queens, New York. It is airing live on Fight, which is now called Triller. So Triller TV, you can stream it on there. We've got Penta, El Cerro Miedo, coming back to challenge Mike Santana for the House of Glory World Championship. Got uh, Mustafa Ali making his hog debut against Alex Shelley. And guess who else is coming to House of Glory? Danhausen. Oh, yeah. Danhausen is coming to House of Glory on Saturday. Making his debut. There's going to be a meet and greet as well. Danhausen and the Solomon Monster in the same place at the same time. Should I be worried? I don't know. I may be worried to go over and, and, and say hello to the guy. Although I guess, you know, I guess I'm kind of bringing him in, though, as the commissioner. Anyway, that's coming up on Saturday. It's going to be a very busy weekend. And uh, hopefully you guys can be a part of all the fun there. It's going to be a good time. Now let's get to your messages here. We never. Okay, we're back. I told you we had bad weather. 
I told you we had bad weather. <laughs> Danhausen cursed me? We have so much wind here in New York. Maybe it is Dan. I don't know. Maybe maybe he put the Danhausen curse on me. I told you that might happen. It's very windy here in New York. I don't know how it is by you. So let's get through these super chats before we uh, we don't have a chance. To. But if you want to drop one, get them on in. Again, I don't know how updated this list is. So let me read it from here instead. So I want to make sure I don't miss it been all screwed up now for the past few days all right we'll pick up with them here and then uh you'll see the list scrolling in a second the list is not frozen but i, I have to go back to some of them are missing but hoofman hoofman entertainment kicking us off here says rest in peace virgil there's plenty of breadsticks waiting for him in the heavenly banquet Out of breadsticks and meat sauce, right? Uh, Tuxedo T Servo, thank you for the $5 super chat. Prince Vegeta 95. That's where we're picking up here with this list. Uh, yes, we are. Prince Vegeta 95 in Tony Khan's voice. Major announcement. I'm the snowman. Back to you, Excalibur. He's going to be very upset. You keep making fun of him like it when you call him the snowman rodimus prime just left the show good crowd on hand can't wait for sunday yeah rodimus the, the crowd was actually uh hot for the majority of the show i don't know what i was expecting but good crowd tonight uh the juliet rest in peace richard lewis an irreplaceable comedy voice yeah i talked about uh, Virgil, Foley, and uh, Richard Lewis at the beginning of the stream. Very sad that we lost all three of them in the last 48 hours. Uh, Base Beerus, God of Seduction, dropping a $9 super chat. Thank you, Base Beerus. Prince Vegeta says, where would you rank Sting all time? Top 20. Uh, I think he'd be in my top 20, yeah. I think he would be in my top 20. Bender McSimpson. When Matthew Jackson was looking in the mirror, I expected to see the ghost of the ultimate warrior. So did I. <laughs> I didn't know where that segment was going, but then he just kind of looked in the mirror and that was the end of it. I go, okay, all right. Whatevs. Food high. Early to the party this time, says what's up. Food hive early for a change. Usually he's the one who's late to the party. Good to hear from Food Hive. Uh, we got Deontay Swanye dropping an $8 super chat. Sky blue, clap, clap, sky blue, clap, clap. You got a W. Fun episode of Dynamite. Sting Rafter drops were legendary fun matches. All love. Solo. Hey, Deontay, thank you. Joseph Brooks. Uh, with Sting retiring soon, it still pains me to know how his WWE run was. I hate to ask you, but how would you have booked his one-year run in WWE? I can't answer that. You're asking me to book him for a year. I've talked about this on the podcast before uh, as far as booking Sting. I don't remember what episode it was. <laughs> I have no idea what episode it was. I'll tell you what. You want to know how I would have booked him? I would have booked him a lot better than me. That's how I would have booked him. Uh, the Juliet says, thoughts on Sean Spears coming back to NXT? Good for him. Man. You know, I think he lives in Florida. I think he's having another kid soon. He's got a school down there. Not a bad gig. Get paid to basically be home and, and be close to his school. So good for him. J Ray with the ten dollars super chat. Hey J Ray, thank you. J Ray says Swerve's run has been great so far, but he needs to go through a little more adversity before he gets gold. He will lose and get a rematch with Samoa Joe at Double or Nothing. Exactly what I've been saying. 
Jerome Eugenio, is Sting in your top 10? So now we've gone from the top 20 to the top 10. I don't I don't know that he's in my top 10, but he's definitely, safely, I think I would say he's in my top 20. I don't know if he makes my top 10. Base Beerus says, I'm here for the review. Good. Why else would you be? Good. Uh, Alex, thank you for the $10 super chat. He says, Brother Solo, what do you think is the biggest reason Sting was not part of the Invasion storyline? Also, how do you think his career would have been like had he joined WWE instead of TNA in 2000? Uh, he didn't want to join because he had reservations about joining and how he would be booked and portrayed. And also, I think he was on one of those sweet Turner deals where he was paid to sit at home. Right? Because when did he come to TNA? It wasn't until 2003. 2003 is when Goldberg's deal was up. So that's probably when most of their deals ended up uh, being up. Well, not all of them, but like a lot of them were up around 03. So he was content to stay home and collect his guaranteed money. But he has also talked about the fact that he didn't think WWE would necessarily book him properly. He knew the way that some of those WCW guys were treated when they came in, and he had serious reservations about it. You know what? He had every right to feel that way. Had he gone to WWE, though, I think that he would have done very well. I think he would have gone. I think that people would have been into him. They would have dug Sting. And I think that Vince McMahon would have been able to make a lot of money with him. And it's too bad that it never happened. But the fact that Sting had those reservations, I don't blame him for a second. He had every right to feel that way. It's too bad it didn't work out when he was still in his physical prime. Because he had some great matches in TNA. He could have had great matches like that in WWE with Kurt Angle. People like that, right? Kurt Angle and Triple H probably would have gotten that Undertaker. In fact, I guarantee you we would have gotten that Undertaker match. We could have got Sting against Shawn Michaels. Sting against John Cena. Sting against Randy Orton. Sting against the Rated R Superstar, right? We could have gotten all of that. Just didn't work out that way. Uh, Bender. Sky Blue would be a good first match for Mercedes. She would. Uh, if they wanted to heal, yeah. I think that would be good. I think Willow would make sense because Willow was the last person that Mercedes wrestled. When Willow beat her for the uh, New Japan strong women's title. So I think you want to put them in the ring together at some point for sure. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be her first opponent, but I think that's definitely a match that you want to do. Uh, Aaron dropping 20 bucks. Aaron, my God, Aaron, what's going on? Aaron says, who wins? Takeshita or Osprey? Osprey's not losing his first match. Osprey is not losing. Did I? I may have actually forgot to mention that before when I was doing the prediction. But Osprey's, Osprey's. Winning. You're not bringing in Will Osprey and having him lose in his first full-time match in AEW. And then Aaron follows that with a fifty-dollar super chat bomb. Oh, my goodness, Aaron is going nuts tonight. Aaron says, "Who is Okada's first opponent in AEW?" You know, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead to who his first opponent. If he debuts at that big business show in Boston in a few weeks, his first big match would be, I, I think, double or nothing in Vegas. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If Hangman Page is still playing crazed heel coming out of Revolution, I think he'd be a great opponent for Okan. I think those two would really work well together so you could consider hangman page more so if he's a heel if he's a baby face if he goes back to being baby face eh, maybe not so how's that for him? how about hangman and okada we are 30 likes away from the goal that like button otherwise we may not be booking anything today Brandon Proctor with the nine. So in kayfabe, is Sting up in the rafters all night, or did he rush up there once the Bucks started kicking the shit out of Darby? Oh, he's got those old bones. You think 64-year-old Sting is running? He's racing up to the catwalk? 
He was hanging out there all night. That's why they couldn't find him in the back. They were looking for him the entire show. The whole point is the reason they didn't find him is because he was up in the rafters. The one place they didn't think to look. Be calm, see clearly. What's your top three favorite black wrestlers? Do you want me to rank black wrestlers? I that. There's a whole bunch that I like. If I name The Rock, it's going to start a fucking civil war in here. I'm not getting into that question again. I learned my lesson after the first time. You people are, you people in the chat, you people in the comment sections, all you wrestling, all the wrestling fans, all you guys, the whole IWC contingent that latches on to questions like this, you guys are nuts. You guys are out of your minds. Uh, this has been a lot of, I like Bobby Lashley right now. Bobby Lashley is, is one of my favorites. I love Black. Come on. Uh, Barry MK400 says, uh, Sorry I'm late. I was tapped today. I was tapped, but my friend did help me. I mean, he did wait a few minutes and played a song as he ran out to help. Me. You got to find new friends, man. You got to find new friends more interested in getting himself over. Barry, I'm glad you survived that deadly attack. Spartan Sprinkles. Flair screws Sting out of the titles. Sting versus Flair in an impromptu match. Sting goes out with a win and the titles don't get vacated. That's exactly the scenario I laid out a month ago. Remember? I pitched it just like the uh, Keiji Muto retirement, where Keiji Muto lost to Naito, and then he looked over and he called out, oh, God, uh, uh, shit, who was it? Fuck. Oh, God, I forgot. <laughs> the name, uh, ah, who was it? Help me out in the chat, who was it? My God. Chono, thank you, Jesus. My brain is fried. Chono. He called out Chono. Chono never had a proper retirement match. So that was that was basically as much a retirement for Chono as it was for uh, Muto. But I pitched the exact same thing uh, a month ago. Yeah, I, I think there's a chance of it. I just think that they, they already teased Flair turning tonight. So, like, to do it on Sunday would be kind of like, eh, really? Eh. But again, it would accomplish a few things. Like, you're going to have a lot of people in the building who are deflated uh, when Sting loses. And so if Flair turns and plays a part in it, then, or frankly, even if he doesn't, I could see Flair losing his mind and challenging Sting to a match on the spot. They do a couple of safe, very quick spots. Look, I have no interest in seeing Ric Flair in the room, okay? I don't care if it's for 90 seconds and all he does is lay there and take the Scorpion Deathlock. Ric Flair has absolutely no business being in the ring and doing anything like that. But if you were going to do it, it does not need to go long. I, for the love of God, it does not need to go long. It could be a very quick thing. He turns Flair over in the Scorpion, gets the quick submission, and then technically Sting goes out a winner, and then him and Flair embrace and it's a happy moment for everybody. So, yes, there is absolutely a chance of that happening. Do I want to see Flair get physical and get involved in any sort of match? No, I do not. But I'm sure that there is a very safe, quick way that they can do it, get it over with, and then Sting gets to go out of it. Aaron. With the 20 bucks says my buffalo boy garcia beats christian after edges interference exactly right exactly what i pitched earlier in the predictions and you and i are uh, seeing things the same way and let's see we have got oz inglorious a nine dollar super chat i'll be crying like that cm punk fan in chicago when sting comes out on sunday hopefully the camera does not see me look out for my solemn monster sign 
I will. Well, how uh, how close to the ring are you going to be? Let me know where you're going to be sitting. Because if it's not on the it's hard cam, I may not see the Goonthar. Oh, boy. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar, the Magnificent. Oh, boy. All hail Goonthar. There he is. The Mighty One himself, Goonthar, making multiple appearances here on the Dynamite stream. Our final stream. This is it, guys. This is the final stream for the month of February. That's already been our biggest February ever on the channel. And now we're just running up the score to see how... How much higher can we go here? Picked up a lot of subscribers, a lot of new members, obviously a lot of super chats. I appreciate it very much, but it's my last time live here for the month. Yeah, you guys are killing me. So yeah, Oz, let me know uh, where you're going to be sitting. And I'll uh, keep an eye out. By the way, you know, on that subject, I, I, I want to mention this. I want to give a plug because AEW just doesn't do a very good job of promoting this kind of stuff, at least not on the TV show. But if you go to their YouTube channel, or there might be a separate one, it might be AEW Music, it might be a separate YouTube channel, they have four tribute tracks that Mikey Ruckus uh, put together for Sting. Uh, and I know, uh, shout out to John uh, Kiernan, I know he's, he's part of at least one of them. Uh, and they're very good. There are four tracks that I think they kind of tie into different eras of his career. Surfer Sting, Pro Sting, AEW Sting. Uh, four different compositions, songs uh, that are very good. And you can go find them on that uh, YouTube channel right now. So if you were not aware of them, now you are. And you should all go check it out and uh, leave a comment. Aaron, my goodness, again, Osprey for the world title at All In. You could do that. We had this conversation last week. Somebody asked me a question about this. I don't think you need to rush the title onto him uh, necessarily this year. I think Swerve should get his run first. If you put the title on Osprey it all in, let's say Swerve wins the title in Vegas at Double or Nothing. Are you really going to give Swerve three months now with the title? That's not long enough. You know, I think he... He's worked hard enough and earned the right to be champion for a little bit longer than that. So that's my only issue with it. I feel he should get the title first. And Osprey will have his time. It does not have to happen at all in. I think you can give him a big match at all in, but it does not need to be for the title. So they've got him locked in, I'm sure, in a multi-year deal. He's not going anywhere, right? He's all theirs. Like he said tonight, he's all theirs. There's going to be plenty of time to belt him and get that title on. It does not have to happen this year. Uh, Food Hive says, did you see the return of Rick Grimes? And how do you like the show so far? I personally love Rick Grimes, and I'm excited for the series. What say you? I have not seen it, and I am way behind on all of the spinoffs, The Walking Dead. I, I feel like I'm one of the few who stuck with the original Walking Dead for all 11 seasons. And I have not watched more than one episode so far of any of the spinoffs. I saw the first episode of the Daryl and oh, not Daryl of the uh, the Maggie and Negan one. I have not seen any of the episodes beyond that, so so I am I'm way behind on everything. But I do plan on watching it. I miss Rick too, so I will check that out at some point. But I can't say anything more because I haven't watched it. Yet. Uh, the journey, this journey called life that we are all on. Yes, this journey called life with a dollar ninety nine. What will it take for AEW to get over this plateau? You know, sometimes you can't predict who or what will catch fire and when. All they can do is competently book their top talent, come up with stories that are interesting and compelling that people want to watch, push them all as hard as you possibly can. For all the people who are hurt right now, you've got Samoa Joe, you've got Hangman, you've got Okada probably coming in, you've got Will Ospreay, You've got a lot of great young talent in Hobbs and Ricky Starks and Takeshita, Garcia. There's a lot of great talent for you to work with. Come up with compelling stories, put together matches that people want to see. That honestly is the best thing that you can do. And just hope that it catches on and people are interested enough to want to tune into it. You know, Mercedes is obviously coming in very soon. 
she could be a difference maker in that women's division, but it all boils down to Tony Khan and what he does. You're only as good as the way you're booked. It's not like they go out there and have control over every little thing they do. There's a basic story, and you know, you set up the program and the story, and you tell them this is what you're going to be doing. He's the boss, right? He's the boss. So what he says goes, and whatever ideas he comes up with are the ones they go with. And, you know, they just signed this former WWE writer, uh, Jennifer Peppermint. She's coming in soon. Uh, she's going to be working with Mercedes, but she's going to be working with everybody. And so maybe she can bring some fresh ideas to the table. It's always good to get ideas and insights from people other than just one person. I think that could be a positive thing. I don't know what great ideas this woman in particular came up with during her time in WWE, but I don't see that as being a negative, that you get somebody else in there who can creatively try to come up with stuff that hopefully is interesting that people want to see. That's it. That's that's really all they need to do is focus on that. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that will work. Uh, we have got Alex says, do you think Tony Khan would ever move Dynamite to Mondays to compete with Raw? If so, what would Tony need to do to give AEW any chance of competition? That will not happen. He has said that will not happen because he will not compete with Monday Night Football. They have obviously interest with the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're not going to compete against themselves. So that is not going to happen. And that should not happen. That would be suicide for AEW. That would be a very, very stupid idea. Aaron with another $50 bomb. Buy or sell. Pro Sting versus Surfer Sting. I'm partial to Surfer Sting. I'm a surfer sting guy. I'm sorry. I gotta go flat top sur surfer sting. That's my guy. If I had to pick one, that's the one that I pick. Uh, Barry, did you talk about the Maxine stuff today? I why would I? This is an AW stream. I'll probably talk about it on Sunday, but the short of it is, it's pro wrestling. People get booed. This is this is not a story. The fact that this even blew up as a story to me is ridiculous. I don't see what the story is. But I'll I'll talk more about it on Sunday. Much ado about nothing. Arabian Night 2000. Buy or sell on who was the bigger loss for Triple H in the WWE? The Undisputed Era guys or the collection of Swerve, Malachi Black, and Keith Lee? Uh, Swerve, Malachi Black, and Keith Lee. I think that there were a lot of things that could have been done with those three. And it was a huge missed opportunity. Losing the Undisputed Era guys was also a blow. Triple H, I know, loved those guys, especially Adam Cole. But losing Swerve, Malachi, and Keith Lee, I mean, there was money there. There was, mo there was real money to be made with those three, or even two of the three, if all three didn't all end up getting over. And the fact that they lost all of them, it's just such a waste. It's such a waste. And Oz and Glorious, we will be seven or eight rows up directly across from the camera. Cool. Well, then uh, make sure. Well, hopefully, I don't know what the policy is at the Greensboro Coliseum. A lot of these buildings have been taking people's signs away from them before they even get in. Uh, some people get very covert about it, you know, depending on how big the sign is, you know, under their shirt. But then that, but then the sign is so small, you end up not seeing it. Shout out to Paul. I know Paul over in uh, Portland. He went to Raw a number of months ago. And they take signs away from you before you even walk in. So he had like a cloth banner that he smuggled in. He had like the Sound Off logo. He's like unraveled it. And you got to get creative with some of these buildings. So I will look for it. Hopefully they do not take people's signs away from them because that would be very lame. Uh... Oz and Glorious again, shameless plug, GWO fam, my main band, IOTA, just dropped a music video, please check it out, it's called The Timekeeper. Uh, so there you go, IOTA, I-O-T-A, The Timekeeper, check it out. 
I'll have to check that out too. Aaron with the $10 super chat. Crow is my favorite movie, so I am biased for Crow's State. The Crow was a great movie. I haven't seen the original Crow in many, many years. Uh, it's still, you know, very upsetting, you know, what happened to Brandon Lee. I mean, what, what a waste. Crow's thing is cool. I just, you know, again, I think it's how you grow up and who you're watching when you grow up. I'm partial to the colored face paint that Sting would wear, and he was all loud, and, you know, he'd, he'd shout, and he'd cut these loud promos. Crow Sting was the exact opposite. He didn't even speak. He said nothing. <laughs> he said not a word. So it just depends on, you know, depends on the person, what you like more. Oz says Maxine will be just fine. She is hot as fuck. She is a very attractive woman. Uh, but again, it's wrestling. I mean, what, what are we doing here? You know, people get booed. People say you suck. A lot of the wrestlers, a lot of the male wrestlers have heard far worse. It's not her fault that she has no business being in the ring on television. They have a fucking performance center. That is where she should be. They for forced her on television. It's one thing for her to be on television yeah, yeah, as a valet. Yeah, yeah, hey, Oz, thank you. Yeah, just popped up now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's one thing for her to be a valet, but you know, to put her in the ring like that when she obviously is not prepared is obviously, you know. It really is insulting to her. It's not doing her anything. It's just throwing her into the fire when she's not ready to be on television. She's not ready for prime time. I mean, it's like having a chicken dinner in the oven. And you hope that one day, you know, when the chicken pops and it's ready, or, well, I don't know if the chicken pops, turkey pops, but when the chicken is ready, man, it's going to be a great meal, right? Well, try taking that chicken out of the oven when it's only half cooked. See how that works out for you, okay? You'll be shitting your brains out for the next four days, and it's not gonna taste too good. She's only half cooked. She's not even half cooked. She has no business being on television. So yes, she's not good. She may get good one day, but if people wanna go to the show and pay their money and boo, I mean, look, they're not chanting things at her that you know, you wouldn't want a little kid to hear. It's not like they're chanting horrible things that people shouldn't be chanting. You know, we're talking about booze or at worst saying, hey, you suck. I mean, yeah, Bliss fan, that, that's kind of her gimmick. Even with the Alpha Academy, she's in training, right? She's not that good. She's trying to improve and get better. I mean, seriously, if you're a wrestler and you can't handle being booed, or having, you know, one or two fans say, hey, you suck. You're in the wrong business. You need to go find something else to do. I, I don't see how this blew up into a big story. I really don't. I saw her name trending on social media. I thought something happened. And I clicked it. I said, what, what am I missing? Here? Like, this is why? This is why she's trending? I mean, this is what wrestling has become here in 2024? Like, what are we doing here? I don't get it. Uh, hey, uh, this journey called life. Wow, you can't hear it, but the wind outside? Holy shit. <laughs> holy shit. Uh, this journey called life says, I'm sorry, but Banks coming to AEW is eh. Uh, you and I are going to have to agree to disagree on that. Well, hopefully she'll prove a lot of people wrong then, if that's the case. She'll have to just come in and prove people wrong. And our retro KOH, it made no sense for it to happen, but I love Wolfpack Sting. A lot of people like Wolfpack Sting. It did not make any sense for it to happen. You're right. But there are a lot of people who like Wolfpack Sting. They thought the Wolfpack was cool. They had cool music. I always liked the Wolfpack's music. Thankfully, it died down. I thought, I thought, the, I thought the window was going to blow in. I don't know what's going on out there. Crazy. It was raining earlier today, and then the rain stopped. 
and uh, now it's just wind. Anyway, let me just double check here, make sure I did not miss any of them. I think they all came in. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Uh, the light skull was 450, and guess what? We were at 471, so we did make it. We made it, boys, boys and girls. We made it. Thank you. Let's go ahead and be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. Yeah, no, uh, hur hurricane season is not over. Well, let's get through this before uh, Mother Nature knocks me offline here. Then you'll all be very upset at me. We don't have a chance to do this. Let's book some matches. We uh, we had a clean sweep the other night, didn't we? Okay. Say no more. We begin with... Ha uh, pro uh, brr, start over again. Uh, we begin here with <laughs> Santana and Ortiz, proud and powerful. I got tongue-tied. I was going to say pride and pride and glory. Uh, proud and powerful. Santana and Ortiz. Santana, the reigning house of glory, world champion, and a fine champion he is. Proud and powerful. Stepping into the ring with... Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, D-I-Y. Why could we not have seen that match? Now we're never going to get it. The only place you're ever going to get that match is right here in Be the Booker. What a great match that would have been. Too bad. Move on. Ladies, Be the Booker. Hit the button here. AJ Lee. We begin with AJ Lee, the former Divas champion. I know people were hoping for a cameo in the Women's Royal Rumble. We did not get it, but there's always next year. She couldn't be back now anyway. She has to be at home to help Phil. She has to help Phil recover. All right, AJ Lee. Who would you like to see AJ Lee step in the ring with? What modern talent should we pick? as AJ's opponent. AJ Lee one-on-one -on -one with Sonya Deville. Sonya Deville still out recovering from a torn ACL. I feel like 85% of the women in WWE are currently out with a torn ACL. She should be closing in soon, though, on her comeback. Soon enough. And uh, I think that would have been a good match. I think AJ and Sonya would have been good. All right, one left to go. Here we go. I'm ready to hit the butt. I'm ready. I'm ready. Here we go. We begin with the lethal weapon, Steve Blackman. Steve Blackman, who now, believe it or not, and I think he's been doing this for a number of years, Steve Blackman, where has he been? He is a bail bondsman. He is a bail bondsman, yeah. Or a bounty hunter. I don't know, but he's doing something pretty cool. 60 years old, still going strong. Steve Blackman. I like Steve Blackman. He's never a main event guy, but not a guy you would want to mess with. Not a guy you would want to mess with. Not at all. It's a great story uh, about Blackman and uh, JBL at an airport when uh, JBL was getting on his nerves. All right, here we go. Be the booker, main event time. Who will be the opponent? Let's find out. The lethal weapon, Steve Blackman, one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, no. He did it again. I don't believe it. The Rock says, I'm stealing your spot. Look at this son of a bitch. The Rock has come back, and The Rock has taken Steve Blackman's spot. Steve Blackman was about to be in his first main event, and The Rock came back and took his spot. Do you believe this guy? Do you believe this fucking guy? Unbelievable. <laughs> he, he took his spot. 
Okay, well, change of plans. We begin with The Rock. Fucking guy, unbelievable. Let's see who The Rock is going to be fake. I'm sorry, Steve Blackman. No, don't look at me. I'm not looking to piss that guy off. All right, well, let's get another drum roll going, I guess. The Rock. One on one. With Bruno San Martino. How about that? The longest reigning WWE champion of all time against the rock that is a clean sweep for the second time this week bruno and the rock there's one guy roman reigns will never pass that's one that's one thing i i guarantee you i am i am certain of that we don't have to worry about that that is a main event, and yes, it has to be in Madison Square Garden. Like, if you put Bruno in Huntsville, Alabama, for example, I don't think that it would hit quite the same as it would if Bruno was out there at the Garden. Wow. That is a hell of a main event, though. Prime Rock against Prime Bruno. Well... Poor Steve Blackman got screwed, but at least we got our clean sweep, right? That's all that matters. Well, thank you guys for uh, joining me here tonight. We covered a lot of ground, not only with Dynamite, but we talked about Revolution as well. We talked about some breaking news on the visa issues with some of the CMLL talent. So if you came in late, it's a lot to go back and check out after the fact. Uh, the next time I am with you live, uh, is going to be on Friday night, and that's going to be a big SmackDown because Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, w w what's his position on the board, right? He's a board member, right? He doesn't really have a title. He's just a board member. All right, well, this guy over here, The Rock, is going to be back on SmackDown on Friday night, and he is going to presumably answer the challenge of Cody Rhodes. So The Rock will have something to say. Whatever it is that he has to say, I will talk about it. So that'll be on Friday night. And again, just to remind you, check out the House of Glory show. If you've never checked out a hog show before, we're back on Fight. Uh, we were on a different service for a while. Now it's called Triller TV, but we're back on Fight this weekend, 6 p.m. A little bit earlier than usual, 6 p.m. Eastern show. Uh, it's going to be a good one. And then on Sunday, you got two podcasts, episode 851 of The Sound Off, and then that night, the AW Revolution Review, where we are going to be talking about Sting's final match, Sting's last stand. It is the end of an icon. Very sad. We'll talk about that on Sunday night. Uh, will I talk about Virgil on the podcast? Uh, yes, I will. I will talk about Oli, and I will talk about Virgil on Sunday as well. We will talk about both of them on Sunday. Spoiler for Collision, Eight Man, awesome. Eight Man Tag was awesome. Yes, yeah, so uh, Collision was taped tonight, for those of you who don't know. I guess because of the pay-per-view, they weren't going to run it live on Saturday, I guess. So Collision is taped. If you care about that sort of thing and you want to avoid spoilers, just be aware of that. that those will be around in the next few days. Be well. Stay safe. Thank you for the love. Do it all over again on Friday night. Come on back. and We'll uh, kick off the month of March in style. Until then, thank you for a great record-setting February. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys Friday.